I did a, a special Pastor Mike online uh, today, and uh, if you have not seen it, I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. Uh, the, the YouTube version is, should be online now. Um, the sermon audio version, not yet. Um, I had to, usually I convert everything and then upload it as soon as I'm done. But I mean, today I got up and ran out, um, head to the, uh, to the urgent care. And um, so it should be online. But what I did was I've, I spent uh, last week collecting um, videos of, um, let's say, paranormal, supernatural events. And what I believe to be genuine um, apparitions of devils. Um, I, didn't, I didn't cover uh, in today's uh, broadcast, I didn't cover the, uh, the idea of whether or not these things could even be seen. Uh, we know that they can be discerned. Amen. Uh, and let me explain that um, as we uh, kind of get into the service tonight. Uh, in fact, I, I, I would, I'll be honest with you, I would rather discern one than see one. Um, but discerning of spirits is one of the gifts that God gives us uh, through the Holy Ghost and through the Bible, through the Word of God. The more you learn about God, the more you learn about the Holy Spirit, the more you learn about uh, how God acts, how he, how he works, what he does, what he won't do, uh, and so on, um, the, more, the more accustomed you get to knowing whether or not a spirit is of God or it's of the devil. The Bible tells us to test the spirits. And God never has a problem with anybody testing spirits or questioning whether or not it, this is of God. If you remember uh, Samuel, when Samuel was young, he grew up in the house of Eli, his mother. Who was his mother? Samuel's mother. Who said Hannah first? Uh-huh. The rest of you copied him. Hannah, 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 Hannah did. Yeah, Hannah was uh, Samuel's mother, and she gave because God had given her a child that broke the matrix, broke the womb. Uh, then she gave that over to Eli as soon as he was weaned, and Eli's like, "Oh, great! Now I got a kid to raise." Uh, but anyway, Samuel was a good young man, and when God spoke to Samuel. Um, he called his name Samuel. Samuel thought it was Eli, and he runs to Eli in the middle of the night saying, Eli, did you call me? Eli says, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Leave me alone. He goes, lays back down again. Samuel, he runs back to Eli. Eli, did you call me? No. Third time, he, um, he hears Samuel. He goes back to Eli. Samuel, are you calling me? No. And Eli then perceived that it was the Lord. He said, next time you hear it, um, then say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth, because Eli knew that it was the Lord. And so the next time he said, speak for thy servant heareth. God did not, um, he did not uh, punish Samuel for not knowing who it was the first time. Um, when, I, uh, when I surrendered to the call to be in the ministry, uh, my pastor, preacher Goff, gave me uh, some very, very good advice. And I've never forgot that. He said, Mike, I would rather God call me many times and know for a fact that it was him than to think that he called me once and be wrong. And I never forgot that. So God doesn't have a problem with us asking him, God, is this of you? And if it is, show it to me in your word, because that's how we test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Those spirits 
are going to be subject to the spirit of prophecy, which is in the sure word of prophecy. So anyway, where was I going with that? What was I talking about? Anyway. That was good, though. Huh? Discerning spirits. Yeah, but I had something else in mind, too. So anyway, um, learn how to discern spirits. Learn how to know whether something is of God. Learn how to know whether somebody that you're dealing with is of God. Okay? There are people who they may, on the outside, agree with everything you say. But inwardly, they're wolves. And, and those are a little bit hard to, hard to figure out, but God will eventually show you the truth. There are people who uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything they believe or everything that they do or say, but I genuinely feel like they are true brethren. I don't have a problem in the world uh, associating with them or worshiping with them or calling them a brother in the Lord. And so it takes that kind of discernment, all right? Uh, but the more you learn the Bible, the more you learn about God, the more you learn about the Holy Spirit, the better discernment that you will have, okay? What's right? What's wrong? Can I do this? Should I do this? Should I work here? Should I not work there? Think, things like that. Things like that that we think are mundane. That doesn't really matter. God may think it matters. And so you learn to follow the Lord. All right. Any questions tonight so far? Anybody? Anything out of the Bible? Anything you're just going, man, I've always wondered about this and never could figure it out and don't know what it means. Anybody, anybody online? A weird one. That's my favorite kind. Okay, her question was, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, um, all of the Egyptians took off their earrings, their nose rings, um, any gold that they were wearing, pearls, silver, things like that, and they gave it over to the Jews, to, uh, to, the, to the people of God as they were leaving uh, for whatever reason, the Bible doesn't say that that was payment for all the years of slavery. The Bible wasn't saying that uh, they were doing it, but, and sort of like saying, here, take our silver and get out of here. We're tired of you people and all of our kids are dead anyway. And so the Bible doesn't really give us uh, so much of an answer to that, at least in that place. And then you were saying, what else? In Job. Right. It says that everyone gave Job a piece of money or, you know, and their whole earring. And the latter of Job was less than from the beginning. So, like, just the earring stuck out to me. I was like, why would they give him a million? I know for money, but. Right. Um, let's see here. And she's referencing Job, where at the end of Job, Job's getting back on his feet. Everybody gave him. Uh, money, they gave him gold, they gave him silver and so on to get, to get going again. And um, there is a verse of scripture and I've, I've heard people reference it. Um, I haven't really seen it. But I, the, the verse that I've heard sort of goes something like uh, the wealth 
of the wicked is laid up or laid in store for the righteous. Um, I'm looking at Psalm, is that up there? Yeah, Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, uh, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Um, I ha I, like I say, I've heard that verse, or I've heard people reference that verse. I know a lot of charismatics use that verse, um, especially their, uh, their preachers. Their preachers are always using verses like that to convince people that this year is going to be the breakthrough year. This year is going to be the harvest year. This year, God's finally going to do it. All of the wealth of the wicked, he's now going to turn over to all of us. Right, And it's about money. It's basically about uh, follow, follow our ministry and give uh, millions of dollars to our coffers so that we can live high on the hog because this year is finally going to be the year. It's going to be the breakthrough year that where God finally is going to take all the wealth of all the wicked people and give it over to the just or give it over to the righteous. Uh, but I have, like I say, I've never read word for word. I've never read that verse. I don't know where they get it from. If somebody uh, who is watching online might know that verse or whatever, please post it in the comments uh, to this or post it in uh, or send me a text message or whatever. Okay. In other words, I don't know. I don't know. One thing I know is that with all of the gold and silver that the Egyptians gave to Israel, what did they eventually do with it? They made a calf out of it. They threw it all, they took it all off, threw it into a melting pot, and lo and behold, a calf jumped out of there. Holy! Imagine that. Uh, so I, that maybe there, maybe it's something to do with that. I don't know. I do know that um, at the end of all of the wicked rulers of this world, the beast, the false prophet, the dragon, the dragon's going to be cast into. Uh, the bottomless pit, beast and false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Um, when Christ begins his reign, then literally all of the wealth of this world is going to be turned over to the, the nations of this world who have chosen to, to serve Jesus Christ for that thousand years. They're going to inherit it. They're going to inherit, uh, I believe, a land without war because they're going to beat their swords into plowshares, and um, which also tells us that uh, there is going to be some amount of labor on the earth, although I think God's going to make it easy. Certainly, we know that, and this, this is what I like, every mountain and hill on the earth is going to be flattened down. I can't fathom that. And every valley, the Grand Canyon is going to disappear. Niagara Falls is going to be the Niagara River again. Okay? It's going to be even. Um, there is not going to be any high places, low places. Rough places, um, nothing like that. So with all the swords and all of the resources of the earth turned into food production. I mean, anybody knows this. If you took all of the money that every nation on the earth spends in uh, military defense, there would be no more poverty. There would be no more lack. There would be no, there would be no child going to bed, starving to death 
at night. It, it, would, it would cease instantly. And something like that I am looking forward to. Okay, amen? All right, who next? A question. Something that you've read, you don't understand, you don't know what it means, and you want to embarrass me in front of everybody. Well, that's a good question. Let's look at it. Firstborn. Here we go. Exodus 12. God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. So... Um, I don't, um, if we go back to the promise of it, like Exodus 11, let's read that, Exodus 11. And Moses said, thus saith the Lord, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Not just, I don't believe it was just the children, um, or the firstborn babies. It was the firstborn period. Um, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. So, and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against the any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that you may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And so I believe that uh, a man could be 70 years old, but if he was the first born child in his household, he died that night. Um, a man could be... Um, he could have two or three wives. He could be the father of uh, 20 children. But that night, that man, if he was the firstborn of his family, him and his firstborn child died that night. If one of his wives was the firstborn of that family, she died, or does it say male? No, it just says firstborn. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it, even the firstborn of the maidservant is behind the mill. So I think it was male and female, adult and child, horses, cattle, dogs, chicken, sheep, um, whatever else it was in the land of Egypt. If it was the firstborn, it died that night. So can you imagine the next day, the howling and the wailing that took place in the land of Egypt as everybody, uh, when they woke up, there is all of these dead people in every house, somebody more than likely is dead. The amount of, um, the amount of work undertaken to take these bodies and dispose of them. You've got human remains that have to be disposed of. You have animal remains that have to be disposed of. And this is, I mean, we're not just talking about a little city. We're talking about all of Egypt. However far Egypt had spread, that's how far it went. And just the stench of death was absolutely everywhere. And, um, you know, I've told you the story about helping to retrieve a four-day-old dead body. I can tell you that the odor 
from that body stayed in my sinuses for several days after that. I like to never got that out of my nose. I kept washing and washing and I thought it was in my hair and it wasn't. It was in my sinuses and it wouldn't go away. It's a horrible, horrible stench that rose up through the land. So does that answer your question? All right. Next. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Come on, make me work for my supper tonight. I don't care if it's Melissa all night long. Remember, the only dumb question is the one you didn't ask. Or the one that John does ask. All right. The what? Where? Where? What verse? If you don't have a verse, I don't have to answer it. All right, everybody turn to Proverbs 8.31. See, I'm, I'm kind of half expecting somebody to, to really just pull off something weird like, you know, um, like what I talked about today on Pastor Mike Online. All of these weird appearances of devils. And I showed, I've shown Matthew uh, some of what they look like. Oh, here's one. Here's a good one. Oh, goody. Controversy is coming. Get ready. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Jan uh, Janice and uh, Terry. Um, let's see. Proverbs what? 831. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Okay. The area of Sodom and Gomorrah, Admoam and, um, or Adma and Zeboam, according to God, are uninhabitable. Okay, they are not, they are not going to be inhabited forever. God says the same thing, uh, I believe, in uh, Deuteronomy 29. Turn there. Oh, you just wait. You just wait until the question from uh, the Janae family from Broken Air, Oklahoma. Where do you see that one? Now, when I give the answer and you don't like it, remember you asked, okay? Because it's controversial. It is. Uh, Deuteronomy 29. Uh, look at verse 22. So that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from, from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning. By the way, underline those two words together. Salt and burning. And I'll tell you why. Um, if you have a wound, what happens if sweat gets on it? If you put salt on a wound, it burns, doesn't it? Um, salt is, um, I learned this in, in, um, physics class, I think in high school, that rust and fire are basically the same thing, the same process. They are both the oxidization of, um, of a 
thing, okay? Um, rust takes a longer time to do it than obviously fire does, but they both require oxygen. And the oxygen is a, uh, provides the, um, the, the catalyst to convert what was iron or whatever can be rusted, the iron into, uh, into rust, okay? It takes a long time. Salt is what generally does it which is why uh, everybody up north, if you buy a car down here and somebody said, yeah, there was a little old lady up in Minnesota that used to have it, I'd crawl underneath it to take a look at it because there's a lot of salt on the streets up there because of all the snow and it's probably rusted out. Okay, and if it's rusted out, I wouldn't buy it. So salt is a burning. So think about the oceans. Okay, and when God said in Revelation, and I'm kind of getting off subject here, but when God said in Revelation, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there was no more sea. What has God done? He's removed the burning lake. Okay, he's removed the burning lake. When you put uh, salt water on grass, what does it do? It burns it up. Okay, it gets rid of it. And so salt is the same as burning in the Bible. Just kind of keep that in mind. If you ever see salt in the Bible, think of something that's on fire. Uh, all right, now, uh, and then he says, um, it's a salt and a burning that is not sown nor beareth uh, nor any grass groweth therein like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. And even all the nations shall say, wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the heat of his great anger? Then men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord uh, God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. Uh, for they went and served other gods and worshipped them. And so on and so on and so on. Um, verse 28, the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. So basically... Uh, uninhabited land would be any land that God has cursed and he's basically made it impossible for man to dwell there if if you can't if you can't sow seed in the earth uh, then that means number one you can't have farm animals you can't have cattle you can't have anything that grazes you can't grow vegetables you can't grow wheat or corn or anything like that so there's not the possibility to live on that land. That's what makes it uninhabitable. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay, now, the question that was asked, and I'm going to ask you what your opinion is. Is it wrong to be cremated? John, you say no. Rose, you say no. Sister Betty, what do you say? Okay. Courtney? Okay. Is it wrong to eat cream of wheat? Roy, what do you say? No. Matthew? All right. Now tell me why. Okay. Best answer that could be given. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I normally, I, I don't think I've brought this up hardly any. Because there, there are people who hold very, very strong feelings about this. And um, with the way things go on the internet, something like this, I'm going to say, and somebody's going to have a field day with me, okay? Because I said, Mike Hoggard said that you could, uh, you could have a pagan burial like the heathens do and still go to heaven. I'm not saying that. Not at all. Uh, and, but I'll say this. 
So what? So what if they get your body and take you to some voodoo cult and have some kind of wicked ceremony over your body and they defile your body six ways from Sunday and then they cut it up in little pieces and burn it and all this stuff. So what? Does that stop God from resurrecting you on resurrection day? Nothing does. Nothing does. Huh? Ezekiel what? Huh? Valley of the bones. They were very dry. I got, I got better than that. I got better than that. I'm going to ask, is there a difference between a body turning back to dust and a body turning to ashes? Is there a difference? They call us carbon-based life forms, okay? Um, but, oh, Pastor Mike, you haven't quoted any scripture. Okay, now, number one, Sister Betty, you're right. There is absolutely no scriptural condemnation addressing... Um, the cremation of a body. In other words, God does not say anywhere. He doesn't say it in the law. He doesn't say it through the prophets. Christ never addressed it. Paul and the apostles spoke nothing of it. John never said anything about it. And so, so number one, no scriptural condemnation for those who have been cremated. Number two, there is absolutely no difference between a body that has not been embalmed and embalming is in the um, basically the entire record of human history Embalming for normal people is a relatively new thing. It wasn't done for thousands of years to normal people. It wasn't done. When they went um, to take care of Jesus' body, um, Mary and Martha, when they went to take care of Jesus' body after he had been taken down off the cross, they didn't have an embalming machine. All they had was some spices, some ointments, things that they were going to rub on his body to kind of keep the smell down. But they had no agents whatsoever to prohibit Christ's body from deteriorating back into dust and yet Christ didn't deteriorate did he God did not allow his holy one to see corruption the body that they put in the tomb was the exact same condition as when they as when the angel opened up and Jesus stood up and walked out same same condition okay only breathing now okay now here's what Abraham said in uh, Genesis 18. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and what? Ashes. Abra and now Abraham is abasing himself or debasing himself. He's saying, here I'm going to talk to the Lord and I'm nothing but dust and ashes. How is it that I get to talk to God? I'm, I'm nothing but dirt and ashes. I believe, and remember, this is given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. God is letting you know that whether the body is turned to ashes or whether it's turned to dust, it doesn't matter. 
doesn't matter. What's going to happen to this body anyway? It's going to be burned up. Who's going to burn it up? God is. Okay. How about... Seems like there is... I know there's two for sure. But I was thinking David said something about it. Uh, huh? Job? Oh, yeah, Job 42, 6. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent. In, oh, that, and that's not the same. Dust and ashes. Yes. Uh, thirty nineteen. He hath cast me into the mire, and I am become like dust and ashes. Um, your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. Um, so, yeah, that, that works. And then... Here's what Paul said in, um, go to 1 Corinthians 13. He doesn't use the word ashes here. 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Is Paul condemning having your body burnt no he's actually saying even if I give my body to be burned and I don't have charity then I'm nothing I'm absolutely nothing now again I have I have read um, pamphlets that pastors have come up with um, that said that basically if you uh, are cremated, you are following uh, pagan customs and only pagans have their bodies cremated because, and they, he gives some reason, you know, why they have it cremated is to release, the smoke releases their soul up into heaven. How, how, are, how are Indians buried? Does anybody know? They're not. Indians, let me tell you how wacky they are. Indians don't bury their dead under the ground. They build huge platforms and put their dead on top of that platform. As the buzzards and the vultures and whatever flying animal comes by and pecks off pieces of their body and fly up into the sky, Indians believe that that is carrying their dead up into heaven. Isn't that weird? Now, uh, I, I, the, um, uh, who was it? Uh, the Vikings? You had this idea of Vikings, they made funeral pyres where they would take their dead and throw them on fire. The Indian people do it. They throw their bodies on funeral pyres, which are just big fires lit. In fact, there's a whole industry in India of people that do nothing but burn dead bodies. They, of course, they, they charge for that, but they gather wood and they have this big pile of dead bodies and they uh, pour water from the river Ganges on their body to purify them, and then they burn their body. And it's because the belief is, as the smoke rises up into heaven, so their soul goes into heaven. We don't believe that. And because we don't believe that, it doesn't matter. What happens? The condition of your body does not prohibit God from resurrecting you. Think of those 
who are cast overboard and whose bodies have been buried at sea. What happens to a body going down into the water? The fish eat it. Sharks eat it. What then? Um, I was um, I was with a uh, family. I won't say who it was. Some of you would know them. Um, and they were a loved one was dying, and um, the uh, the hospital came in and asked them if when so and so died, do they want to donate any of their um, parts to uh, to be given over to somebody else, uh, like their eyes or things like that, and they said, "Oh no, absolutely not. We don't. Uh -uh, we don't believe in that." And they asked, they they didn't really ask my opinion, which I'm glad, but they said um, um, that they believe that if God is going to resurrect the body, he needs all of it there so he can resurrect it. And I didn't say anything. That, that, that right then wasn't the time to try to correct them. Um, but they absolutely refused to donate any of his parts, uh, either for medical science or for uh, someone else that may have needed a heart or may have needed a lung or may have needed an, a, a cornea or anything else, they refused to do it. And their reasoning was is that God wants a whole body to resurrect. I'm sorry, but that person's been dead now probably 15 years. And to say that their body is intact right now is a real stretch. And uh, so God does not require the body to be intact in order for him to resurrect and bring a new body um, that lives forever. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, again, I, there's going to be some people that are going to disagree. And you're going to disagree because you think, it's, you think that it's based upon a pagan practice and therefore, it should not be done. Uh, however, there are countries that actually prohibit the number of people who can be buried, uh, especially like in Japan. Uh, I don't know ex the exact law, but in Japan, primarily, if you die in Japan, you're going to get cremated. You know why? They don't have a lot of real estate left in Japan. And their burial grounds, you got to be really somebody high up in order for you to have an intact place to be buried. Most people in Japan, of necessity, are cremated. 